those who are, are visiting, we are working our way through Romans, so this morning we continued where Paul left off in chapter 15 of Romans, we're going to catch up from verse 7, so if you want to follow in the Bibles, this is on 192 in the chapel Bibles, so we're going to go from Romans 15, 7 to 13, so 8192. The Chapel Bibles, and we'll be taking it each verse at a time, more or less. So, uh, if you want to follow, that may be helpful. <coughs> so, Romans 15, reading from verse 7. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also has accepted you to the glory of God. For I say, Christ has become a servant of the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God, in order to confirm the promises to the fathers, and that the Gentiles may glorify God for His mercy. Just as it is written, because of this, I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing praise to your name. And again it says, Rejoice, Gentiles, with His people. And again, Praise the Lord, all the Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise Him. And again Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will come, even the one who rises to rule over the Gentiles, in Him the Gentiles will put their hope. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is God's Word. Let us pray together. Father, we, as always, give you praise for your word. <coughs> Without your word, we would not know you. This is the revelation of yourself. Not only, Lord, does it speak of your mighty deeds and great works, but it speaks of you. We know the living God through his word, and we give you great praise. Please, Lord, your word has gone out. God, Holy Spirit, speak it into each heart. Please accomplish by these words your purpose in each one that is heard. Please, Father, may we, may we be blessed by your word. I ask that you will help now as we meditate on your word, that our meditation will be pleasing to you and glorifying to Christ. We ask in his name. Amen. Amen. Now, for those who were here last week, Paul ended off around verse 5, 6 last week with a prayer that the Apostle Paul gives for the church in Rome. He pretty much there prays that God empowers the church to glorify himself. So the Apostle Paul prays that God glorifies himself. God glorifies God. We see two immediate truths from that prayer. The first truth is coherent right through all of Scripture. Well, both of them are. The first truth is that the purpose of all things is the glory of God. That's the ultimate aim of creation. It is not about us, it's not about our happiness, it's not about our good life now. It's about the glory of God. And then the second truth that is also coherent through Scripture is that God is the enabler. God enables His creation to glorify Him. So that is all in that prayer. So the Apostle Paul there in 5 and 6 is really at the top end of things, the ultimate aim of creation, God's glory. But in typical Paul fashion, he doesn't leave it up there, the great height he immediately drops it down to our level and makes it practical. He shows what does this great truth mean in the life of the church in Rome. And that's what we see in verse 7. Therefore, accept one another just as Christ also has accepted you to the glory of God. Because God's glory is our aim, we are to 
accept each other. Some translations say we are to welcome each other. The original language there says to take to yourself, to receive to yourself. And this congregation, this mixed congregation in Rome of Jews and Gentiles with different opinions on whether you can eat this or drink this or keep this days or not, the Apostle Paul says the implication of God putting together this mixture of people in that church and in this church for His glory is that we cannot hold each other's differences against each other. That God has brought this mixture of people together to grow each other, to shape each other, to edify and mold this body to His glory. In a way, accepting each other with those differences is to acknowledge the sovereignty of God, to acknowledge the wisdom of God, to acknowledge the loving provision of God. In a way, accepting each other with these differences there and over here, it's us saying, God knows best. And in us doing this, we give Him the glory. Now the Apostle Paul moves from this truth and this encouragement to that church to almost a kind of a conclusion in verses 8 to 13. But it's not just the conclusion of those preceding verses it's kind of a conclusion to everything that has come before in the book of Romans. So these are weighty verses. I'm going to look at verses 8 to 13 by taking them in three points. Number one, what did Jesus do? Secondly, why did he do it? And then thirdly, what is the outcome of what he did? What did Jesus do? Why did he do it? What is the outcome? What did he do? Before we jump in there, verse 8, I want to remind ourselves of John 1. It's scripture we likely know very well. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. God the Son, Jesus made all things, the heavens and the earth, spiritual powers and everything that breathes. John then in verse 14 says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Almighty God, the Creator, the Life Giver, the Life Upholder, became incarnate. He became human. So let's look at verse 8. For I say, Christ has become a servant of the circumcision on behalf of the truth of God. You see a for, it's an explanation term, explanation clause. So what is Paul explaining? Again, he's not so much explaining only the verses that have come before. He's explaining what underlies everything in Romans so far. The one who made all things, who has all power, who has life in himself, who has ever existed, became incarnate, he became a man. And then what he did as a man, made himself a servant to the circumcision. What or rather who are the circumcision? Well the NIV translation of the chapel Bibles shortcuts the question they translated directly as Jews. The circumcision refers to the nation of Israel, the Jews. Jesus, in His incarnation, did things to become a servant to the Jews on behalf of the truth of God. The Almighty Creator became a servant. This is one of the most mind-blowing things we can hear. This is where the scripture becomes foolishness to the Greeks. It's not understandable. And it doesn't fit with a Jewish paradigm. Where is the 
conquering king? Where is the mighty saviour? Where is God and his power? The almighty creator became a servant. Now the word there has become a servant is written in the perfect tense. And why should we bother with grammar? Because that tells us this wasn't a once-off thing. That this servant ministry continues. The pinnacle of Jesus' work as a man in his incarnation that makes him a servant to the Jews was his death and resurrection. His atoning work made him a servant to the Jews. Now we all know the atonement was completed on the cross. Jesus said, it is finished. The payment for the sins of humanity was done. But the benefits of that payment continue. Anyone who today repents and puts their trust in Christ as their Savior receives that payment, is covered by that payment. So in that way the serving ministry continues. And that's why Paul writes it in that way. Why does he emphasize that Jesus becomes a servant to the Jews? Well, because Jesus did. Matthew 15, 24 reads, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now that's interesting. Jesus came to perfectly do the will of the Father. And the Father made it clear to him that his mission was to come and offer salvation to his people. Jesus is the Davidic king. He is the king from the line of David that was to come and offer salvation to his people. That's why he became a servant to the Jews. Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Paul starts off with this principle of serving the Jews right in the beginning of the letter, to the Romans 1 16 for I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first that's what Jesus came to do and also to the Greek that's what he sent his apostles out to accomplish so here we have our first point what did Jesus do the creator the almighty God became a servant to the Jews. Why? Why did he? Well, he did it with a reason. And this reason has two consequences that we'll look at. Firstly, right up front in verse 8, the reason is given to us. We don't have to wonder about it. He became a servant to Israel on behalf of the truth of God. That's the reason. What does Paul mean with on behalf of the truth of God? The truth of God. In the New Testament, if we see God's truth or the truth, it speaks of Jesus. I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus, his life, the whole gospel is the truth. But in this case, God's truth is given context by what is around it, and we see what follows on it there in our scripture is the promises to the fathers, or the promises to the patriarchs. In this case, God's truth references covenantal faithfulness. That is what Paul is referencing. We can then kind of rephrase or restate verse 8 as follows. That he became a servant to Israel in order to show that God is truthful or faithful. How does Jesus becoming a servant to Israel testify to the faithfulness of God? Paul answers that. Because the act of servanthood confirmed the promises to the fathers. It leaves us with another question. What promises and who are the fathers? If we turn back to Romans chapter 4, we read promise to Abraham. And we read in 4 verse 16 that the promise rested on grace and was guaranteed to Abraham's offspring 
to all who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So we know that the promises are the promises given to Abraham and the covenant of promise. We know the patriarchs or the fathers is Abraham and all those coming after him to which these promises were renewed. God promised that he would make a mighty nation out of Abraham. This nation would become the vehicle through which the promise in Genesis 3.15 would be realized to reverse the curses that descended on creation because of the fall of in Adam's sin. This covenant promises included descendants, land, universal blessing. Not only would Abraham and his descendants be blessed, but in, the, in Abraham all the nations would be blessed. Paul shows that in God's promises to Abraham and his descendants, all of these promises are fulfilled in Christ, in Jesus. In this way, Jesus has been the vehicle through which God has been shown to be true to His promises. The fact that the Apostle Paul is actually writing this letter testifies to God's truthfulness. Paul is a Jew. He is a Christ-believing, saved Jew is evidence that God is faithful to His people. This is possibly one of the most important things that the Apostle Paul could bring to the church in Rome and indeed to us. That God is truthful. We actually sang about that earlier. All of our faith rests on this. If God was not going to be truthful in His promises to Israel, then why bother? Why would He then be truthful in His future promises? God being absolutely faithful and truthful to every word that He has ever given is central to who He is. Why we follow Him, why we can trust in Him, because He will always do exactly as He has said He will do. That allows us to trust in the living God. Several hundred years, 700 years exactly, um, before the dedication of the temple in Jerusalem, Joshua leads Israel through the Jordan into the Promised Land. At this dedication of the temple in Jerusalem, Solomon quotes Joshua in his opening prayer. He says, Blessed be the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promises which he spoke by Moses his servant in 1 Kings 8. Not one word has failed, not one word will fail. God is truthful. And this is the second point. This is the answer to why Jesus became a servant to show that God is truthful. But the Apostle Paul doesn't stop there. He continues on with his way of thinking. He says, as we've just looked at, that Jesus became the servant to confirm the promises made to the fathers. And we are clear on that. In him all the promises are fulfilled. He realizes all of these promises given in the covenant of promise. But then in verse 9, why would the Gentiles glorify God for His mercy in Jesus becoming the servant to the Jews? In the covenant of promise, God not only promised the blessing on Abraham and his descendants, but He said, in Abraham all the nations would be blessed. And Jesus being obedient to becoming a servant and providing salvation to the nation of Israel, He also provided a way of salvation to the Gentiles. But Paul does show the difference there. In a way, Israel could almost have insisted 
that salvation be given to them, or a way of salvation be given to them, because it was promised to them. But the Gentiles had no such promises. God didn't make any promise to any Gentile nation. The promise was to Abraham. The fact that this Messiah also came as a Savior to the Gentiles is purely God's mercy. And that is what the Apostle Paul emphasizes. That the Gentiles will praise God for His mercy. But in typical Paul fashion, he wants to expand even further. Not only has God showered only mercy on the Gentiles who are undeserved, who didn't have anything to claim on, but he wants to show that this has always been God's intent, that the Gentiles be included in the plan of salvation. And he goes to the Old Testament to do this. He gives his trademark as it is written. If you see this, you know Paul is going to quote the Old Testament at you. He gives us four quotes. Each one of the citations contain, contain the word Gentiles. Three of them praise God. Three of them have that and again. This all serves to bind these things together. They have the same theme running right through. But then why give us so many? Maybe one could have done the job. The Apostle Paul has two things there in mind. Firstly, if you think of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible is divided into three sections. The Law, the Prophets, the Writings. It's structured slightly different from our Old Testament. Paul quotes from each one of these parts of the Tanakh. Symbolically, he shows that the whole of the Bible supports what he is saying. And that it is clear and coherent through all of the Bible. And then secondly, as we'll see now, these quotations aren't quite the same. They don't do and say quite the same thing. If we start off in verse 9, verse 9 seems to be a quote from the Septuagint, or the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It seems to be Psalm 17, verse 50. That would be Psalm 18, 49 in our Bibles. I say it seems to be because these words are identical and repeated also in 2 Samuel 22 verse 50. So we're not quite sure what he has in mind. Which one he has in mind. But the quote is the important part. The quote references the song of David. This is a song of praise to God for victory given to David. David defeated the Gentile nations. He says, Therefore I will praise you among the nations, or Gentiles. I will sing the praises of your name. And that is what Paul <coughs> quotes here. <coughs> what is significant, and that the rest of the text tells us, after David defeats the Gentile nations, they actually turn and follow him. David says that God has made him the head of the nation, so that a people whom I had not known served me. He defeated them, but then they turned and followed him. This is a picture. David pictures Christ. His victory on the cross brings the defeat to Satan and the world, the Gentile nations, and then they turn and follow him. In verse 10 then, we go to another part of the Tanakh. We quote from the law. Deuteronomy 32, verse 43. Again from the Septuagint translation. There, Paul quotes from the Song of Moses. So he's into the Psalms. We didn't know that Paul was a bit of a musician as well. Soft spot, soft spot for the Psalms. The part that he quotes in Deuteronomy 32 is the last verse of this song of Moses. It's a song of victory that calls all the nations to celebrate with Israel their deliverance by God. You see the progression. In the beginning, the nations are defeated and they come to Christ, to David, picturing Christ. Here, they don't just come, but they are called together with Israel to come and praise God, to praise Christ. And then verse 11 is a quotation from Psalm 117, verse 1. It's a short psalm of praise, celebrating God's steadfast love and faithfulness. 
Verse 1 of this psalm has a synonymous parallelism. Praise the Lord, all nations, extol Him, all peoples. It's the same thing repeated in a different way to emphasize it. But again, there's a progression. In the first one, the nations come to Christ. In the second one, they are to join with Israel in praising Him. And now we have all nations, all people. There's one people glorifying and praising God. Think of Revelation 7 verse 9. The great multitude of all nations, all peoples, all colors, all languages praising the Lamb. This is what this reference looks like. So Paul has shown that this has always been God's plan to bring in the Gentile nations. He's shown how God has moved, but there's still a missing piece there. The missing piece is the how. And that's why verse 12 stands out a little bit. He breaks his normal pattern there and actually gives the author of the quote, Isaiah. He does this to emphasize this is the how verse. The quote is from the Septuagint translation of Isaiah 11 verse 10. That Isaiah 11 begins with the root of Jesse. It looks forward, it prophesies the reign of the Davidic Messiah, the Messiah, the Savior that would come from the line of David. So Paul has shown that this has always been God's plan. He's shown how God has moved and he's shown how God would save the Gentiles. The prophesied eternal king from the line of David that would come and save Israel would also be the Savior of the Gentiles. So Paul has shown that God has been true to his plan of salvation. The earlier promise of Genesis 3.15 that the woman's offspring would bruise the head of the serpent that was renewed in the covenant of promise has been carried out. Salvation came to the Jews and was available to the Gentiles as well. By the descendant of David, the Son of God. So we've seen what did Jesus do. He became a servant to the Jews. He said, why then? To show that God is truthful. Our third point, what is the outcome? As he did in verse 5, he gives a prayer now in verse 30. We know this because he starts off now the God. He's addressing the Lord in a prayer for the church. Previously, in verse 5, he prayed that God glorify himself. Now he prays slightly differently. Verse 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that here's the what he's asking for, God. By the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Abound is to overflow. So full it runs out of you. Now this prayer immediately tells us two things. The first thing that it tells us that all joy, being full with all joy and peace, abounding in hope, is possible. Paul is not going to pray and ask God for something that cannot be. So the church in Rome and this church and everyone in this church is to know that to be full with all joy and peace and hope is possible. But then also from this prayer, we see that it is the work of God. The God of hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Then why not? Why often are we not full with joy and peace and hope? If it is the work of God, why aren't we? Well, verses 12 and 13 really is about God's work. If we look at verse 12, it's about the promised Messiah. He is the Savior of Israel and of the Jews. He is the object of our hope. Then the Father is the provider of hope in 12 and 13, and the Holy Spirit, the grower of hope. But again, why aren't we always joyous and peaceful and hopeful? 
because don't miss that we have a role to play in this. And our role is central to God's work. If we look at verse 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. To believe in, to trust in. Believing there is equally translated as trusting. We have a central role to play in God filling us with joy and peace and hope. Pastor and writer in the US, Alistair Begg, says that our hope is a result of our engagement with the promises of God. That behind our hope are the promises of God. If you are sure that God will fulfill His promises, then you have hope. So our hope is grounded in the expectation of the fulfillment of God's promises. Raises a question then, do we know God's promises? Preaching on this verse, verse 13, in 11 November 1877, Charles Spurgeon said as follows, To know joy and peace through believing, we must begin by knowing what is to be believed. And this we must learn from Holy Scripture. For there He is revealed as the God of hope. Unless God had revealed Himself, we could not have guessed at hope. But the Scripture of truth are windows of hope to us. Think back for those who were here last week on what Paul read in Romans 15 verse 4. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. <coughs> God is the source and the object, but the scriptures are the means. Our faith is to be focused on the person of Christ and the truth of God. And we get to know Jesus and the truth of God and His promises that we build our hope on in God's Word. Simple example in John 6, Jesus says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. This is a promise. It is knowledge of and faith in these promises that is our hope. That He can do and He will do as He said He will do. That our hope is not in ourselves, the things around us, the things in this world, our bank accounts and our insurance and all of these earthly things that are in God and His promises. So let's move to our conclusion. All of the book of Romans and indeed all of the Bible, verse 13, joy, peace, hope, all of these things begin in verse 8. Everything hinges on what the Apostle Paul shows us in verse 8. That God is truthful. That God will do as He hath promised. That in Jesus all promises are fulfilled. That Jesus is who He said He is. And He would do as He said He would do. We are all recipients here of God's mercy. As with the Gentiles, we don't have any things to hold on to or to claim to. We're not special in any way. We're not more holy. We don't have super good lives. We cannot earn anything. We are recipients of God's mercy. By His mercy, the Holy Spirit has gifted us faith. But faith in the beginning is small. It needs to be watered to grow. It needs to be nurtured. In the beginning, our hope is small because of, um, our knowledge is small. Our understanding of God's promises is limited. But this promise of overflowing hope is ours. We need to grow into this. 
The thing is, Christian hope is an absolute certainty <coughs> in a future outcome. It is to be certain of this thing. That's why our hope and God's promises and His faithfulness are interlinked. Our hope is to be grounded and comes from God's promises and we believe in them because God is truthful and God is faithful. But even for those that have been children of the Lord for a long time, know that we need to spend time in God's Word. We need to be renewed by the Spirit through God's Word to know Him, to be absolutely certain of the trust worthiness of God and to be clear on His promises for us. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. This is a fact. We ought to know the facts. Jesus said of those who would believe in Him, I will raise Him up on the last day. This is a promise. We ought to know the promises. We ought to believe promises. God will in each one of us and us together if we place our trust in Him grow joy and peace so that we can overflow with hope. If we hold on to His sure promises if we trust in Him if we look expectantly at our God because He is able and He is truthful. Let us pray to Him. Father, we praise You for these truths. That You are truthful. That every word that You speak is so and will be done. Thank You, Almighty God, for Your promises. Thank You, Lord Jesus, for salvation in Your name. Thank you that by placing our trust in you, you will raise us up on the last day. Oh Lord, what a glorious day that will be. May you, Father, fill each one here with joy and peace. And may by the work of your Holy Spirit, you have bound hope and the sure promises that you've given us and each one of us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.